So I'm speaking about uh, the social cost of carbon and uh, uh, some work that Kevin Diaratna and I have just published in uh, a journal on this. Now the backstory is we published a paper with the late Pat Michaels back in 2020 in a journal called Environmental Economics and Policy Studies. And what we did there was we took one of the models that was used by the EPA to calculate the social cost of carbon and we updated it to reflect more recent evidence in the literature on some of the key parameters and showed that it made quite a big difference in the estimate. And I'm gonna explain what the social cost of carbon is, or at least what it's purported to be. Um, and the, uh, so the, there's a large literature here that's aimed at generating estimates of the social cost of carbon and we made a contribution to it. And then more recently someone published a critique of our work and so the new publication that Kevin and I did that just came out is a response to that critique. All right, so social cost of carbon. Um, love it or hate it, this number plays a big role in a lot of regulatory decisions. It's basically why we can't have nice things anymore. Um, the social cost, of cal social cost of carbon calculations are very dependent about a handful of assumptions in the key models that are being used. Now, if the number comes out near zero, that implies that releasing a ton of CO2 emissions doesn't really have any negative economic consequences. And if that's the case, you can't justify costly abatement policies. So for a long time, the economics literature has been putting out a lot of results that says the social cost of carbon is pretty close to zero, may even be negative. And so on a cost benefit basis, most of the climate policies that get discussed fail the test. Um, as a result, governments around the world are conspicuously trying to find reasons to boost the social cost of carbon estimates. And um, so there's a few key things that they can do, like introducing tipping points into the model or mortality functions or agricultural damages or, or anything. Um, and, and there's a kind of a contest in the, the literature who can publish a tweak that generates large social cost of carbon numbers because regulators will love it and your work will get uh, praised and highlighted. The work goes on in what are called integrated assessment models. So these are combined climate and economy models. They were first developed by William Nordhaus at Yale University who eventually got a, a Nobel Prize in economics for this work. And um, the model runs an economy and an, a climate together over time and solves for the optimal social cost of carbon, optimal based on all the assumptions about the sensitivity of the climate to greenhouse gases, the damages from warming, and the costs of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And it's especially that last part that matters. The cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is very high. And as a result, integrated assessment models have traditionally shown that most of our mitigation policies aren't worth doing. Uh, Nordhaus's work himself has shown that for the most part, you just have to live with it. That um, you can't really justify expensive emission abatement policies. And the way that's expressed in economic parlance is the optimal price of carbon is too low to justify aggressive emission cuts, certainly too low to justify net zero targets. Now, key parameters, first one is equilibrium climate sensitivity. And this is a parameter in the model that says how much warming would you get if the amount of CO2 doubles in the atmosphere? And obviously, if you have more warming, then that has bigger effects on the economy in the model. The discount rate is the parameter that says how much you should downweight costs and benefits that happen in the future compared to those that happened in the present. And then the CO2 sensitivity refers to how much agriculture productivity is boosted by having additional CO2 in the air. Now, um, the equilibrium climate sensitivity in these models, as used by the EPA, is based on something called the Roe-Baker distribution. So the Roe-Baker distribution, um, this was from a study published in 2007 that looked at the behavior of a whole bunch of climate models and they drew that green line that you see there, a distribution of possible climate sensitivity estimates and it ranges from a low of one and a half degrees up to about seven and a half degrees at the upper end 
and it has a median of three degrees. So when the EPA runs these integrated assessment models, they, they run it thousands and thousands of times and draw samples from the Roe Baker distribution and then they get a distribution of social cost of carbon estimates. And they did that with three major integrated assessment models that go by the names of DICE, Fund, and PAGE. Now, as far as the discount rate, the Office of Management and Budget recommends for public projects a 7% discount rate. In the climate literature, a lot of economists say, well, if we're talking about such long time horizons, we should use a lower discount rate. So and typically in climate economic studies, people vary the rate from 25 to 7% just to see what the effect is. And then the CO2 fertilization, there's one model, the fund model, that includes benefits to agriculture from all the extra CO2 in the, in the air. The two others just ignore the effect altogether. So um, they don't have a CO2 fertilization effect at all. Now what we did, um, Pat and Kevin and I, we took the fund model and we made a couple of changes to it. So first of all, we took out the uh, Roe Baker distribution and we used a new empirically based uh, climate sensitivity distribution due to um, Nick Lewis and Judy Curry. And uh, that distribution had a mean or a median sensitivity of 1.6 degrees and a range of 1.2 to 2.2. And this was based on, not on running climate models over and over, but based on observations over the um, 19th and 20th century applied in a, a, an estimation model. And then there's another estimate uh, John Christie and Dick McNider did using lower troposphere data, which came up with an, a median estimate of 1.4 degrees and a range of 1.1 to 1.8. Obviously much lower than the Roe Baker distribution and consequently they generate lower social cost of carbons. As far as the CO2 fertilization effect, uh, the fund model was set up based on information available in the earth, early 1990s. Since then, there's been a ton of work on uh, global greening and also um, the plant benefits, uh, agricultural benefits of CO2. And so we used a meta-analysis published by uh, Chalinor et al., which showed that the CO2 fertilization effects are much larger than what had been anticipated 20 years earlier. So we tested for 15 and 30% increases in the fund model agricultural productivity parameters. And then we used a variety of discount rates. So the results of that paper, if we stick with the Roe Baker ECS estimate, but we increase the CO2 fertilization by 15%, that didn't have a big effect. The social cost of carbon falls by about 4%. But if we go up to a 30% increase, the social cost of carbon falls by about 25%. The bigger effect, though, is updating the ECS distribution using either Lewis and Curry or Christy McNider. Um, that causes the social cost of carbon estimates basically to fall to zero out through 2050. Even without increasing the CO2 fertilization effect, uh, the social cost of carbon falls from the mid-30s down to under $5 using a 2.5% discount rate and falls to minus 77 cents using a 5% discount rate. So the results look basically like that. The upper line is the result the EPA calculated using the Roe Baker distribution. The three lower lines are what we got using either no increase in CO2 fertilization or 15 or 30% increase. And those are the estimated social cost of carbon rates from 2020 out to 2050. Any one of those three lines would mean you can't justify any climate policy on cost-benefit grounds. Okay, so then a, pub, a comment was published last year by Philip Meyer. We don't really know anything about him except he's a U.S. government employee somewhere. Um, he pointed out that the Lewis and Curry 2018 paper has been superseded by a, a new study by Nick Lewis, which was published last year, which has a median ECS of 2.2 degrees. Uh, he also argued that the Christian McNider estimate isn't really relevant because people live on the surface, not in the troposphere. Uh, he argued the Chalinor meta-analysis has been superseded by an analysis by Moore et al., which has a very large data set, and 
they found much smaller CO2 benefits and net losses from warming. And then going over the discount rate issue, he said the DICE model uh, has a close to a 5% discount rate, so uh, that would be an appropriate one to use. He didn't recalculate the social cost of carbon estimates, so we go through all his comments and then do it for him. And so our responses to that, first is yes, the, the new paper by Lewis is a good analysis. What Lewis did was, in the most recent IPCC report, they've stopped using climate models to generate their distribution of ECS estimates. Instead, they latched onto a study by Sherwood et al., which um, combined paleoclimate and modern instrumental data and came up with an empirical estimate. And uh, what Lewis did was he showed that, okay, that's a valid method, but they were using older versions of the data sets. And if you update the data sets, and even the IPCC has updated the data sets, uh, the median uh, distribution falls to 2.2, which is well below the IPCC's estimate of 3.1. But also, if you confine it just to the instrumental data set, their method gives you 1.8C, which is pretty close to what he and Judy Curry had estimated before. On the second point, uh, we point out that the troposphere data is actually ideal for the purpose. Uh, yes, people live in cities on the surface, but that contaminates the surface temperature data, as the last panel discussed. Um, so the tropospheric data, if you want to isolate the effect of CO2 on warming, that would actually be an ideal data set to use. The Moore et al. study just reused the Chalinor data set. Uh, it wasn't a new data set at all. What they did was they changed the estimation method, but they didn't provide any details about their, um, their modeling assumptions. But you can tell that they use different functions that just suppress the CO2 effects and the benefits of adaptation. And uh, so we don't find that a, a credible advance on the earlier work. And then finally, okay, 5%, we'll go with that. So the new result, if we use, first of all, if we used a 2.5% discount rate and the new 2.2 uh, degree ECS, uh, and we don't change the agricultural fertilization effect, then the new result's about midway between what we published a couple of years ago and the old Roe Baker analysis. So the Roe Baker result would be the top red arrow. The result we published a couple of years ago is the bottom red arrow. The new uh, result based on the Lewis distribution would be the red arrow in the middle. But there's still a 15% chance the social cost of carbon would be less than zero as of 2050. If we use the 5% discount rate, uh, the numbers there are probably too small for you to read, but under any assumption, whatever disc using the 5% discount rate, but whatever CO2 fertilization effect we put in, using the Lewis 22 ECS estimate, the social cost of carbon uh, is $3.39 as of 2050, and that's the, the highest it gets. Um, so putting all these things together, if we look at the social cost of carbon at 2050 using a 5% discount rate, um, under the Roe Baker distribution, it's over $5, but using the new Lewis 22 distribution, it's $3.39, 33% probability that it's below zero, meaning CO2 is a net benefit. Whichever one of these we choose, and the Christie McNider estimate there is minus 72 cents. Either way, and again, these are the models the EPA themselves used, um, you can't justify any climate policies on cost-benefit grounds using these kinds of numbers. Uh, I'm almost done, actually. So um, the, uh, the conclusions that we reach, um, in our 2020 paper, we showed that updated empirical evidence yields social cost of carbon near zero, at least through 2050. Uh, we don't agree with all of Meyer's recommendations, but if we take them at face value, the result is that the social cost of carbon remains very close to zero or below zero for many decades and the resulting social cost of carbon number is well below any level that would justify current mitigation policies. Now, none of this is to say that we agree with those models or with the parameter choices or things like that. The, the point here is to say, 
okay, this is how you guys constructed the case for your regulations, but you haven't used very good data in your models. So if we improve the data in your models, your own models say that you can't justify the policies. Um, working in a field like social cost of carbon calculations, it's always a moving target. So um, more recently what's happened is um, uh, the EPA seems to be gravitating towards a study that was put out by Resources for the Future, which now gets rid of all the integrated assessment models and has brought in a couple of brand new ones that uh, no one's seen before. And they have much, much higher social cost of carbon estimates. Uh, so it's, it's now going to be back to the drawing board to take those apart and figure out why it is that even though they're, they've also conceded that the emission projections are way too high. So they've cut their emission projections quite a bit, but they're still getting, well now the social cost of carbon estimates is, is about $170 a ton. So there's some magic sauce in there somewhere. And like I say, they've, um, uh, they, they're not even using the, the models that they used a couple of years ago, the three integrated assessment models, including the one that got a Nobel Prize. Um, now those are out the window and they have brand new ones um, that we haven't seen before. So it's a moving target, like I say, but um, those are the uh, last few findings that we've got into the, into the literature. Thank you. <laughs>